you can now find me on Roadster, the app connecting people through cars. Good morning, ladies, gentlemen, and everybody in between. If you want miracles, I suggest you seek out the FBI. If you want controversy, try instead BMW. Today, I am driving the all-new BMW M4 Competition. it's pretty fair to say that the previous generation M4 was already a fairly controversial car, if for the introduction of the M4 nameplate and nothing else. People have become so familiar with the old M3 badging that a change to M4 just felt wrong. That I think we've certainly got over, and whilst the early M4s received a lot of criticism, BMW did address those with successive improvements to the car, and they've become a bit of a darling of the tuner scene, replacing for many the Japanese cars of 10 to 20 years ago. But all that paled in comparison to the reception that this car got when it was announced, and there were plenty of reasons why BMW purists were upset. Let's start with the blindingly obvious, shall we? The looks of the thing. I think it's fair to say that very few cars in recent times have received such a negative reaction as this. Because in pictures, it's really not a looker. I will maybe go out on a bit of a limb here and say that whilst I agreed with everybody when the car was announced, having now seen a few in the flesh, I don't actually have that much issue with the front end. If anything, I actually quite like it, particularly because it blends very nicely into the bonnet, and the M4 in particular really wears it quite well. The M3 looks a little bit less comfortable with the way that it looks, and I'm not so sure why BMW chose to fit this obviously fairly controversial front end to a car which in normal guise didn't have the same look. The regular new 3 Series up to and including the M340i have a kidney grille that's pretty standard BMW. All of the 4 Series range has this kind of big gopping looking thing, so it made sense for the M4 to have it. What's most upsetting to me is the fact that the car clearly didn't need an aperture that large. If you look at the front of the car, you'll see a lot of it is deliberately blocked off. Perhaps other parts of the world it was more of a necessity, but here I somehow doubt it. More troubling for me in the styling department is the fact that the side profile of the car has more than just a little bit of Ford Mustang about it. The rear I have no issues with though, same for the interior. It's actually pretty nice. Familiar of course to anyone who's driven a current generation 3 or 4 series. There are pieces I like and pieces that I don't. I like the carbon fibre trim, but I'm confused at the fact this here is gloss black and nearly nothing else in the cabin is. This car, I'm sure you've noticed, does not have the optional carbon kit. The reason for that is that its owner decided that he didn't like the sort of mix of carbon and gloss black on the exterior, and he didn't get on with the carbon seats. I personally do. I really, really like them, and if I were on the hunt for a new M3 or M4, I'd definitely be seeking one out with the carbon pack. Compared with some other manufacturers, BMW didn't even charge an awful lot either. It was less than £7,000 for all the carbon stuff, whereas some other marks will charge you about three or four thousand pounds just for the seats. Ferrari will charge you nearly five grand for some carbon paddles, wheel, and a couple of small bits in the cabin. Ceramic brakes are available on this car, but these steel items do the job absolutely fine. Today is not the day to fully test them out, but they've behaved themselves impeccably. Pedal feel is decent, and stopping power is absolutely ample. The other thing to note, if you do option the ceramics, if ever you have to replace the discs, and hopefully you won't, they can be very expensive. For another video, I recently looked up the price of BMW ceramics, and they were actually almost double the cost of the equivalent item on a Ferrari. This car is in the very nice colour combination of Tanzanite blue over Silverstone leather interior. It was about £300 for the leather. You could have got a little bit more if you went for the full leather option. BMW, I felt, have always been slightly confusing because the standard leather in M cars tends to be what they call extended, and if you want all the leather, that's then full. I don't really know why they use the term extended, because that to me implies that it's got more 
when in this case it doesn't. Nevertheless, this is still a fairly nice feeling place, although for the money BMW are asking, some of the little scratchy bits of plastic and vinyl here, here, and the slightly down market headliner are a disappointment. More on pricing though in a little bit. Other things people found controversial with this car were the fact that the dual clutch gearbox was replaced with an eight speed ZF automatic. And here in the UK, we got no manual option. This is as a result of something I call trim creep. Over the last few years, we've seen manufacturers introduce even more varieties of some of their cars, even more trim levels. Audi, for example, didn't used to do trims for their RS products, but now they do. So it's no longer enough to spend £100,000 on an RS6. You have to spend one hundred and fifteen on an RS6 Vorsprung if you actually want all the toys. Porsche have done a similar thing. You used to have the Carrera, Carrera S. Now you've got the Carrera, Carrera S, Carrera T, Carrera GTS, and we're likely to see other variants introduced soon as well. And the fact is, the base model may not be dramatically more expensive than it was, but it's now the car that nobody wants to buy. In fact, a Carrera S these days is a reasonably rare thing because what people want is the GTS, and that's a car that gets introduced at the start of the model run now rather than at the end. Here we have exactly the same thing. So this is the M4 competition. Historically, you'd have, you say, M3, M4, then a bit later, they'd revise it, do the competition. Then finally, towards the end, you'd have the CS, which would be a more expensive special version that was often sold alongside the competition. In the UK, the regular M4 is a car that's unlikely to ever make an appearance. Compared with this car that had a slightly lower powered variant of the engine, 450 horsepower, and it also offered the option of a manual gearbox. But here, BMW simply didn't think anyone was going to buy it, so they just never offered it. The truth is that here, most people did tend to go for the higher specified models, and they spec the dual clutch gearbox anyway. I thought it would have been a nice token gesture, at the least to offer the manual gearbox, but the simple fact is, I don't think the manual actually works with this version of the engine. As I've mentioned it, we may now talk about it because the engine is one of the few parts of this car that wasn't particularly controversial. It's called the S58, and it's the hotted up version of the now pretty familiar B58 3 litre straight six. It has some revisions and revs allegedly a little bit higher, so the red line is 7,200 RPM. In this car, power figure is 510 PS, that's 503 horsepower, and the torque figure is a staggering 479 pound feet. That's 650 newton meters. That's significant because only yesterday I drove a McLaren GT with the four liter twin turbocharged V8. That had less torque than this. Unlike the B58, this has a pair of turbochargers over the single twin scroll item that you get in the regular engine. The regular version has already become a bit of a tuner's darling, and I'm told that people are already getting rather scary sums out of these without much in the way of serious modification. So expect these to be making stupid power and big noises in your local car park coming soon. The other thing people talked about a lot was that, like many of us in the last two years, this car's put on a lot of weight. It's significantly heavier than the old version, around about 100 kilos of gain, depending on exactly which model you compare with. The claimed weight for this car is 1,725 kilos. I will say two things for BMW about this. Firstly, they are unusually honest with that weight claim. Other manufacturers, for various reasons, not all nefarious, will struggle with giving you an accurate weight figure for their car. If for no other reason than the amount of options you can add, production tolerances, so on and so forth. But here, an independent website that I use to verify weight claims of manufacturers measured two M4s. One of them was actually eight kilos lighter than that claimed figure, and the other was only about 10 kilos heavier. The other thing I'll say is that Alfa Romeo's Giulia Quattrofoglio claims to be one of the lightest cars in its segment. The fact is, it's barely any lighter than this, despite the presence of a carbon bonnet, carbon prop shaft, and lots of other stuff. I'm not saying Italian scales are a little bit off, but I stood on some once, and it said I was eight stone. 
this weight gain was inevitable. Crash and emissions rules have made it harder than ever to create a lighter car. In spite of this, it remains lighter than the equivalent Audi and Mercedes. It's even marginally lighter than the original Nissan GTR, despite being a bigger car, and shockingly, only half a fuel tank heavier than the current Mercedes CLA 45S. Many manufacturers have begun using more exotic materials to compensate for these increases. Disappointingly, BMW seem to have gone the other way. The previous M3 and 4 had a simply stunning carbon fibre strut brace in the front, which was a beautiful piece of automotive art. In the new car, this has been replaced with what appears to be some recycled bits of old playground. I have no doubt it's functional, but it really does cheapen the whole car. This is my three-point turn hill start torture test, and this being an M3, it has to be a decent all-rounder, and you know what? It's perfectly nice, easy to drive, has good visibility, and thanks to the optional upgraded driver pro pack, has 360 cameras as well. There aren't many options on this car. It has a comfort pack too, which gives you an electric tailgate, a heated steering wheel, and uh, something else too. Uh, and it's got the driver pro pack, which alongside the cameras also gets you some basic self-driving ability and stuff like that. Pushing the list price of this car up to about 80 grand. If you ticked all of the option boxes on one of these or the equivalent M3, you could easily spend £90,000. A huge sum of money. When you consider for a moment I've just driven Audi's new RS6 and that has a starting price of a hundred grand, and people complained about that, this is a car that should sit a good class or two lower, yet still commands a pretty hefty premium. Reviews of these cars did eventually start to come through and the opinion seemed to be quite divided, with some very much liking them and others accusing it of losing that bombastic, darty character that previous cars have had. The last generation M3 and M4, particularly the early generations, had such a spiky character about them that on a day like today when the road surface is still mildly damp, they were not any fun whatsoever. They were in many cases simply terrifying. They were a car that in a straight line you could have a big accident because you'd be going along minding your own business, you'd pull the paddle for a shift and the car would give you such a brutal kick in the back that you'd feel like it was going to unstick the entire thing. Very nerve-wracking, not confidence inspiring. So then, is the new car any better? On the practical, boring front, it scores fairly highly. But this is an M4. It's got to do more than just that. I have engaged M1 mode here. As with all modern cars, you've got a ludicrous amount of customization, including, worryingly, for the brake pedal. The car's now in its stiffer suspension setting. You can feel it's just got that little bit firmer. Now I've got the gearbox in manual mode, and we're going to have some fun. answer then. Is it a perfect car? No. Do I care? No. Do I like it more than the old one? Yes I do. Now I've got to explain why. First off, the punch. It's got plenty of it. It does have a little bit of turbo lag, more than I might like. However, in this case, and in this rear-wheel drive variant, X-Drive is now available for these two, does help your traction just a little bit. Feels like it feeds in a little bit more gently than the older car. If you looked at dyno graphs of the old M3 and 4, as they evolved, BMW fed that torque in ever so slightly smoother, and it makes a big difference to how these things behave. The B58 you find in stuff like the Supra and the 40i engine cars was already a seriously torquey item. For me, the big improvement with the S58 is that it does actually give you a reward for taking it all the way to the red line. It feels genuinely fizzy and exciting. It wants to get there. And that's nice, and it's the sort of thing you want in an M car. 
it is for me an improvement over the old lump that had no real interest in going anything beyond 5000 rpm. It also, certainly on one of my favourite B roads, has absolutely no issue with overall pace. Despite the presence of water on the road and Pirelli's on the big, slightly ugly looking wheels, it grips pretty well. You can sense that it is having to look for some traction, but it is also finding it. Steering is also something of a revelation. McLaren are unlikely to be kept awake at night by it, but compared with some other BMWs of late, it's actually genuinely entertaining. It's actually the opposite to some Audis that I've driven recently. Those have a nice weighting, but not an awful lot of texture and feedback. This feels a little bit light. I'm just gonna check what it's set to. It's actually in its comfort mode, so I'm gonna move that over to sport. But it does still move in your hand, it does wriggle, it does give you a rough depiction of what the road is actually doing. And I really like that. This also feels like a very easy car to place. I'm much more at home in this than the old 4 Series where you felt like you were far too low down with a bonnet that was impossibly broad. This, much, much easier to place. For fun, I did try the brakes in their sporty setting and predictably, just like sport for the throttle, all it does is make them needlessly grabby. Why BMW, why? Like most modern cars, this doesn't really sound like all that much. Inside, the majority of noise that you're hearing is not actually coming from the exhaust, but that doesn't bother me. From outside, it sounds like a, an all right BMW, which is a big improvement on the old M3 M4 that was simply an awful nasty racket. Naturally, there is already a great selection of aftermarket exhausts available if you do want a little bit more. I personally wouldn't bother, but that's mostly because within this beautiful, youthful and aerodynamic shell lies the heart of Victor Meldrew. The auto box is another one of those items that, I have to be honest and say, is a little bit of a step back. Many people criticised it, and I can understand why. It doesn't have that incredible snap of a DCT unit, doesn't respond as well as even some older 8-speed ZFs, and it is a weakness. However, not enough of one, I would say, to detract from the overall experience. One thing that is really impressing, though, is the ride quality, because it's actually pretty darn good. This is a very rough road. And even with the chassis in sport mode, though I can sense everything that's going on, the car's not shaking me about. I'm not being beaten. I'm being moved, but not smacked. Important distinction. I'm still being somewhat cautious because I know it is a big, very torquey turbocharged engine with only two wheels being driven. So in the bends, on a day like today, things could go very wrong very quickly. If you engage the M2 mode, easily done thanks to the nice little red rocker switches on the steering wheel, you also get access to the MDM mode, which is BMW's halfway house traction control. In the dry, I'd certainly be using that. But it's not dry today. And in all fairness, the traction control feels like it is helping rather than hindering. This is a car that gives you very quickly serious confidence. And on this road, in these conditions, I know that's not something that comes easily to all cars. When Richard ordered this car, the X-Drive wasn't actually available. He later got told he could have upgraded to it, and the price difference in list terms is only about three and a half thousand pounds. The fact is though, certainly for us living in the southern half of England, I think this car is still perfectly adequate. I've no doubt there are loads of people out there absolutely convinced that they need the X-Drive variant. And for my friends in the north, I'm sure that's probably well worth having. But the fact is, you and I both know full well, loads of people will go and buy the X-Drive version, run it with Cup 2s on, and then wonder why they're still getting stuck in the snow. That's Britons for you. Let's take a step back, talk about some other more boring stuff. Like I said, the interior largely just like in an M340i. I don't like all the switches down here for two reasons. Number one, they're all gloss black. Secondly, they do all feel exactly the same. So if you want to operate something quickly, you are gonna have to look here. And you've got some fairly important buttons, including the one for the exhaust note, but we think that might only adjust the interior volume and some other stuff as well. You've got the electronic parking brake, but that's about the only one you can actually find. I do thank BMW for using a fairly ordinary gear selector. It's actually quite nice in the hand. Also has 
different profiles for the shift as well. In fact, as I just moaned about the gear shift, I'm gonna put it in its most aggressive setting and see if it actually gets any better. So we're now in setting number three, let's go. <laughs> No is the answer, still a reasonable delay with the shifts. In auto mode, it's very well behaved, does more or less everything that you ask it to, it is a perfectly fine gearbox. The benefit of a traditional automatic over a DCT is that for the more boring stuff, it can be a lot better behaved, a lot smoother, a lot more natural. The Harman Kardon stereo, I haven't really had a chance to test because every single station is talking about the same news topics. Boot space is excellent in this car, rear seat space is pretty decent, even fuel economy is not that bad, with the owner getting about 30 to the gallon on the way up here. For a performance car, that's not quite so bad, and actually, it's not going to get dramatically different fuel economy in regular usage to the M340i xDrive with its entirely pointless mild hybrid system. fact is, I know a lot of people, even those who have actually driven this, still mourn the old car. But as far as I'm concerned, it's like mourning your mate when he's drunk. Yes, he may have been hilarious, but he was also wildly inappropriate, and he did get you barred from that pub. This car has grown up quite a bit, it's matured, but it can still get the job done with no hesitation when you ask it to. <laughs> This I think is important because let's be honest here, your average SX car park lout is highly unlikely to be spending the thick end of 90,000 quid on a car. For your younger driver who's maybe looking to upgrade from a Golf GTI or something like that, this is probably gonna be too much of a financial leap. And that's absolutely fine because the fact is it's the M2 which really for many has taken over from the old M3. Not just in price, but in size, performance, and everything. For many people, the M2 will be all the car you ever need. My only real criticism of this car is that for the asking price, BMW could have chucked in a little bit more leather, a few option packs, that sort of thing. The fact is that 18 months ago, when these were first announced, you could get a discount on them. And so the price you'd pay would actually be, I think, very reasonable. However, now, trying to get a discount on any car, used or new, is more or less impossible. So I have to judge this as a 90 odd thousand quid car. And that's absolutely fine because there is something else that people tend to buy as a fun daily for around 90,000 pounds, a Porsche 911. Historically, there's always been a bit of a price difference between the two with the 911 usually being in the real world 10 to 20,000 pounds more than the M3. And though the M3 on paper was often the 911's equal, if not it's better, once you got down to things you realized that actually the 911 was the much, much better car, not just from a driver's perspective, but in terms of build quality, materials, and everything. Now though, it's not so clear. My opinions of the new 992 are fairly well known. And the simple truth is that if you gave me a choice between a Carrera S or an M4 competition as a daily driver, I'd take the keys to the BMW every single time. And I wouldn't even mind looking at it in the morning particularly if it was in that very nice Isle of Man green. I know basically everybody is specking their M3s and M4s exactly the same way, but it does look quite nice. So there we have it, the M4 that everybody, myself included, thought they would hate the most, turns out to be the one that I actually really like more than any other, with the possible exception of the E92. That I did not expect. A big thanks to this car's owner, Rich, for bringing it out. Thanks to you as ever for watching. Don't forget to like, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.